Welcome to Triumph and Disaster, a show dedicated to manly creativity and culture. Brought to you by your host, Cameron McHarg. Hey guys, this week's episode of Triumph and Disaster is brought to you by TornbergPhotography.com. TornbergPhotography.com and TornbergHeadshots.com. So Maria Tornberg was an international model and actress since she was 15 years old, and uh, she turned into a photographer herself and became one of the most prolific headshot photographers in Los Angeles, one of the most sought-after headshot photographers for actors in L.A. But in uh, recent years, things have also changed. She's become uh, in demand from real estate companies, startup companies, people who just want good shots for their social media, for, uh, for their dating sites, everything. So if you go to TornbergHeadshots.com or TornbergPhotography.com, you can check out her work and uh, just mention Triumph and Disaster and she'll give you 10% off. So just go there when you call her or email her, Triumph and Disaster, and she'll give you 10% off. So continuing with uh, last week, um, I'm going to keep calling people out who uh, leave uh, good comments and ratings and or leave donations at the TriumphandDisasterBlog.com PayPal button. So, starting with John D'Amico. Thanks, John. And I had to start with John because uh, these next people, I just have like their their internet handles, unfortunately. So, if you guys, if you leave a comment or, uh, I mean, you can be anonymous if you want, but if you want to get called out, I'd love to call you by your real name. So, John D'Amico, and then I have Big Dap 6000, I have Bingo 7734, and then I have your ale. So I'd like to just thank all you guys for, for leaving those ratings and reviews. It really does help with Apple to promote the show on iTunes, and I really appreciate that. Okay, this week, Shadi Matar, sometimes known as Shadi Eli Matar, who is one of the – he's an amazing – he's a producer. But one of the coolest things about this this show, actually, this episode with him is uh, it's the first time that we met in person. And – What's kind of cool about it is you can actually hear two people becoming really good friends. I'm actually, I became really fast friends with him. We became really tight. We just got along and just, uh, we just hit it off really well. Super cool guy with a really crazy story. He's originally from Lebanon and he grew up during the war and, uh, you know, made his way over here, did the whole American dream. He had to, you'll hear his story, how he finally got here, but came here with basically nothing. Ended up, uh, going to the, um, the program at the American Film Institute for producing and, now is an amazingly successful producer. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and if you go to triumphanddisasterblog.com, I'll put up some information on how to uh, to follow him. It's a great talk. Super great guy. Hope you guys enjoyed it as much as me. Here's Charlie Matar. No. <laughs> My God. We're recording now. We we're just talking about how I didn't want to I didn't want to start this thing and, and fuck up Shadi's name and call him like Ch- Chady or but something. But I, I fucked up your last name. <laughs> And you, would you call me McGrath? People fuck mine up and call me Mc, like McCharge. I get that what do you, one a lot. How do, you, how do you say it? McCar- like a pi- like McCarg. Harg, Harg, McCarg. McCarg. Yeah, McCarg. Okay. Yeah. McCarg. All right, so we both have yeah. kind of weird names. Yeah, which is good. But I didn't fuck yours up, luckily. So now, Shadi. Shadi, yeah. It's, and your last, how do you say your whole name? Just it's Shadi Matar. Okay. Yeah. So here he is. And I have a guys. middle name, Eli, but I, you know, I just use it for. That's actually pretty writing. cool, middle name. Yeah. Shadi for Eli Matar. Yeah, when I write down my name or something, but... Like know. legal stuff. Yeah. So we were just talking for a little while there. I almost wish we had it recorded. You have a really interesting... Uh, well, first of all, okay, just so everybody knows what's yeah. going on and, and what you do. We're going to bounce all around as anybody knows who listens to this. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Don't have I don't have notes and some, we can go all over the place. But uh, we'll just assume, like, we'll just say, like... Uh, we're talking to they don't know who you are and what you do yeah, so, what's so I um, I'm a producer based in Los Angeles uh, I'm trying to produce a lot of films like a lot of people in the film industry yeah yep. uh, I've done now in various f- stages of yeah, uh, <laughs> yes. uh, I've been here for I've moved to LA around 10 or 11 years ago uh, I came to AFI to study producing and, That's uh, the American Film yeah, Institute. Yeah, the American Film Institute. Yeah, which is a pretty cool. Program. Yeah, it's tough. It's long. It's expensive, but you get to learn a lot of. Um, you get to learn a lot of what you do later on in life and in in the life of the filmmaking process, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so and then I met my business partner at AFI, and we founded a company together, and uh, we've been you know chasing 
producing films. Uh, we've done six so far, which we're very proud of in a relatively short period of time. And uh, we have few in development, so yeah, that's what I do. You have a few in development, and you have one. Uh, how I, I mean, the most recent one because yeah. I just saw the story. I think on Variety for yeah, uh, the Eiffel, Eiffel. film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's actually that's in the works right now, right? That's in the works. It's a very exciting project because I was actually shooting a movie called The Pyramid with mm -hmm. 20th Century Fox in Morocco, and the co-producer we had on the film, Pavlina, she came to me and she said listen you gotta read that script and I'm like on set shooting so the I, Eiffel one yeah the yeah. Eiffel one she's like you gotta read that script a friend of mine is a French producer he has been developing this for a few years and uh, <clears throat> there was like one of those bank liens purchase of a story rights and all of this so it needed money to sort of be untangled yeah. and needed more of like a you know somebody comes in and spearheading the project and I didn't know what this project was about um, I uh, and she's like, look, I'm gonna give you a script, read it. So I started reading that script on set, and the director of the pyramid is like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just reading that script. They just give it. He's like, wouldn't you supposed to be producing this movie that I'm that I'm directing right now? But that's common, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, to yeah but, think, think but about it's the like you one. shouldn't be doing it apparently yeah. like on set. <laughs> it's like fuck this so, movie again. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like over it now. Let's go. <laughs> let's go find another project. <laughs> So it was really funny, but uh, it was an incredible script about this guy who I never knew anything about. Uh, his name is Victor Lustig. He is apparently a master con man. Uh, he went to France and he pretended that he was in charge of dismounting and selling the Eiffel Tower for the Mairie de Paris, which is the city of Paris. So he sold the Eiffel Tower twice as a scrap metal are you As, fucking kidding yeah. me? He, he actually got... He actually he did that. Actually, so what he did is... Yeah, so what he did... And there's a lot of cons that he's done, but this was his biggest con. Yeah. Uh, what he did is a very interesting thing, which is he dressed up as a gas man, as like a gas maintenance guy. Right. And he went into the building of where the mayor is, which was the mayor's building. And because he needed these official documents so he can go around town saying, look, I'm the official appointed person to do that <clears throat> so what he did is like he told everybody in the building you gotta evacuate because there's a gas leak and I'm here to fix it so that day everybody evacuated he sat down he stole all the papers he counterfeited them he did what he wanted to do and he left and then he stationed himself at a very high-end hotel in Paris and he started sending specific like very private specific letters to big scrap metal companies in France saying it's a secret project, but we're dismounting the Eiffel Tower because it's rusting, it's all of this, and you can bid on buying it. And he obviously went to the highest bidder who ended up buying it and sending him the money, and of course he had no right whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> to, you know. just some dude. But here's the interesting part. So <clears throat> the guy who won the first bid and paid him so much money he was so ashamed. And you got to remember that these were the times like in the 30s where, you know, gentlemanship, uh, elegant. I was just going to ask, was this like in the 70s or in yeah, the past? Yeah, no, no, it's like in the 30s. Okay, in the 30s. Yeah, so okay. it was like very... Um, there's a, like a... Yeah, it's like... It's, an honor. Yeah, there's an honor thing. There's yeah. like, you know, you can't go around saying I was so stupid that I bought the Eiffel Tower, you know. People right. will look you down at face. you. Yeah. yeah. So this guy who got basically fucked by paying for the Eiffel Tower, he didn't say anything to anybody. Yeah. For like, so Lustig laid low in Germany for like six, seven months and he didn't hear anything, not in the papers. So he went back to France and reconned everybody <laughs> and he sold it again. But this time, the guy that paid went to the, you know, he spoke, to uh, the police yeah, and became like an investigation. But uh, yeah, but he did it twice, which is crazy. So yeah, actually... <laughs> That's like the old joke, like selling the Brooklyn Bridge or whatever to somebody. He sold yeah, the there, there, yes, that's true. There was a, apparently there was a guy who tried to do that. More interesting that I discovered was that the film, The Stig, which is the, which is with Paul Newman and um, Robert Stig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so The Stig con is a con that Lustig did himself. So he's like a world, yeah, he's but like they, a legendary but, but comment. But to make the film, they didn't refer to Lustig or anybody. They just took that con and they yeah. reshaped it into a revenge story. And, you know, but that con, that specific con of conning a guy into like bidding on horses and stuff like that in Canada, that was a Lustig part of his 
one of his deals one of his deals he's done in his life so so i read that script i was fascinated by it i love biopics i yeah. love these human sort of I, i just love these kind of movies yeah and uh and then i we had to have it so we ended up buying it and and we went into development hell yeah for, i'm i'm in i'm in that myself yeah It's it's, and you know how it is. Years of it, actually. For some reason, you get to a point where the idea and the concept is bigger than what you have. And I think that the idea of the man who sold the Eiffel Tower is big, got bigger than the content we had. Which means that when you send it out to directors or actors, people get very excited. They read the script. They're like, yeah, you know, it needs to be deeper than this. But what is that? That's so familiar to yeah. me. I was just going to ask you about it. No, tell me more about that. Like, so... Um, So I went into development hell in a sense that we went back with the writers, we wrote multiple scripts, we went more into research, more into stuff. And this is an expensive project. It's an expensive process. It's not, you know, you can't... I'm not a writer myself, so it's hard for me to, like... I can't sit down and write a script. So you have to rely on other writers. And luckily, the people that were with us are, you know, very talented people. They came up with the idea, obviously. But it was very... It was difficult to crack a story that is equal to the concept that people think it is when they got, get into it. It's weird. Like they're reading the story and they're reading how this guy did it. And it's fascinating, but it's sort of like not enough to make a film out of it. That's so, so familiar to me right now, man. I, I, Are you going I through wanted, something like this? Yeah, I was going to, like about two years ago, I was about two months away from shooting my, my first feature. Yeah. And... Um, Look, I mean, I understand whenever people want to put some money down or they're producing something, they, they're going to have notes. They're going to have... Of course, know, yeah. It's, it's, it's normal. You know, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's a, the business. And yeah. there's a yeah. lot of people involved. It's not like you're sitting down and you're writing a novel. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff involved. So, okay, you know. <laughs> But it's... It, it, so this thing got pulled. There's, it's a whole long story. The money got pulled at the last minute. This of also course, happens, happens all the time. a lot, yeah. <laughs> but that yeah. didn't help me. Welcome I, to my was, world. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I was devastated, though. I mean, it happens all the time, but it didn't. It doesn't help me. I was like so invested in doing this thing. And were you? Are you going to direct it? Or yeah, you, oh, directed, yeah, we're directing. I was yeah. acting in it too. Yeah, yeah, a yeah, yeah. Part, okay, because doing it all is a lot. Yes. Um, but so now it looks like it's coming back to life again. It has been again for the last maybe a year or so. That's good. <laughs> but. Again, we're back to the the notes thing, and now you know it, it's it becomes. You think everything, every, everybody's excited about it, everything looks great, and mm -hmm. then over time, there's this uh, dip desire for people to want it to be completely something else. It's like, incredible, like, like a completely different. Yeah. Mood. So you have to choose your battles well, but you know at some point. You have to make concessions. I think you just really have to. You have to. You, you have, have to, to make concessions. You also. You also. But yeah. You also. But you. you also have to. I think you also have to stick to the essence of why you got into this in the first place. Yeah, that's so, so why, important. Why, why were exactly. you? Why do you want to make this movie? Or yes. Why do you, and if yes. you go back to this, it. I think it strengthens you into um, going at it again. Maybe in a different point of view, well, but the again, first time that it tanked, it was a lot. I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say take the responsibility for it. I, I was standing pretty firm on a lot of things, and, and, and now you become more flexible. Well, a little bit, but not completely. I mean, there has to be, like you said, there has to be the element of what it is that you're trying to say or what it yeah. is that's important that can't go away. Yeah, yeah. But I understand that you know, but I learned a lot from all this from uh -huh. this thing, and I think uh, I think maybe I was. Being a little too firm this first time, you know, I wanted. To, <laughs> this is the way I want it to be, but I, you know, you, you have to understand that it's not your money going into this thing. Yeah, it's. I mean, know? look, uh, I'll tell you a lot of stories so about. I, I'm very uh, yeah, empathic so, so, with you when you, when you no, talk no, about no. This. So, 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 what happened is, my business partners, they, you know, they're, they knew like how obsessed I was with this, and just like I get obsessed with any project I'm doing. Because I won't make a film if I'm not if I won't pay ten dollars over and over to watch it. Right. Honestly, like I w I won't, because it's a long, demanding process, and if you're not vested into it um, enough, you're not gonna be able to carry it as a producer. You're gonna have right. to carry it. And so what happened is, 
I've developed the project with these, with the two phenomenal original writers, and I love them, and and they're you know they're they're people I I I, I just have an incredible relationship with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we got to a point where like we've gone out with the script to top directors. I mean, you're talking like Eastwood, like Paul Haggis, like I mean, we're talking like top directors. Yeah. That, and they all somehow turned it down, not turned it down as in like oh we're not you know this is shit. More like there is need to be more to it, and I deep down myself I knew there needs to be more to it, because mm. I read it it's exciting but I don't feel moved. Okay. And this and it's coming from a guy I like one of my favorite films is The Aviator, which is which one? Which is The Aviator. Okay. The, yeah. the Aviator from yeah. with Martin Scorsese and DiCaprio. That's like a, a very deep film for me I don't know I love the you film love character. I, character I, I, I love the character so yeah. much and it's, it's just so complex and um, so in a way I'm like searching for the aviator in everything I do you know it's like a, it's a weird thing but it's like you always want to find this character is it that's so complex is it also something to do with a, someone who has an obsession like a, like maybe. a real drive and obsession maybe I think so I and find that obsession. fascinating too, though. Yeah, I, I find this. I maybe I can. I mean, I know this sounds stupid to say. I relate to Howard Hughes in that sense, but I do in a way where, like, my obsession into making this work sometimes goes above and beyond my relationships with like family sure. and like, which is, you look back and you're like, this was so stupid. It's just work, but you just get into it. Yeah, and it's the no, passion. I, I think. So Captain uh, Ahab. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so then what happened is a friend, a very good friend of mine uh, produced a film called La Femme et le TGV. It's a short film with Gene Birkin in it. And I knew he was working on it with this young director. And then they had a screening a year and almost a half ago, a year, a year ago. And he's like, do you want to come see the film? I said, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I'm always looking for new talented people and I'd love to see stuff. So I go, I see this film, and um, here, actually, the director is calling me. That's oh, it. Yeah. It's okay. Do you want to get that? No, 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 it's all right. <laughs> I'll call him in a bit. So, uh, uh, so I go see the film, and in the middle of the film, I'm crying. And I'm crying not because the film is incredible, but I'm crying because for the first time, and I get very emotional about these things, I felt I found the guy who can do Eiffel. I just felt, it was, I felt this is a glove that is for Eiffel. And I said, I'm going to go talk to him. And was, I'm that, was that him? Yeah. I just called That's Timo. Okay. He's, yeah. <laughs> I, I started crying because I was like, this, this, is, this is me. I, this, is, this is us. This is what I'm looking for. It was like a key. So the film ends. I go, you know, to the director. I say, congratulations. Amazing picture. It's truly amazing movie. I said, listen, we just met through Jean, my friend, the producer. And I said, you, you should take this to the Oscars. You should take your film to the Oscars because... You should compete in the short live action. And he's like, oh, I don't think so. I said, listen, you can talk to my marketing guys and team. They can help you. You should do this. And also, what are you doing next? And he's like, well, I don't know. I'm working on some stuff. I said, Google the word, Google the name Victor Lustig. If you like what you see, call me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, he's like, okay, cool. So he's this, you know, 25-year-old kid who wrote the name down on a paper. And I'm like, okay, this is a bit weird because, you know, I've never seen... I'm writing stuff on papers and it's weird. But, <laughs> you know, he... he I, I was fascinated that he actually took it, you know, he wrote it down. And then I get a call in the middle of the night. It's him saying, look, I, I can't sleep. This is crazy stuff. Can we have breakfast tomorrow? I said, look, you can, if you call me at... at Two or three in the morning. I can't have breakfast with you at eight. But yes, that's yeah, why. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I go. I meet. I meet him that day, and uh, he's all over the project. He completely gets it. He is talking what I talk about the project without obviously hearing what I've been saying. He understands. He just gets it. Yeah. And uh, and I said, "Do you want to do it?" And he's like, "Yeah." And I said, "Let's do it." I said, "Here are the scripts. Here are the." Research. Here's the book. Here's whatever. All that. All the stuff. And do um, you wanna do you wanna play with it? And he's like, let me read what you guys been doing, and then let me come up with my sort of version of it, which I wanted because I feel like you get so 
you get so into the thing that you stop seeing. Yeah, it's end. very easy, I think. It's very easy to yeah. stop seeing. You think yeah. it's great, but somebody else reads it and be like, this is shit. Yeah. And, and you like, need that, though. I th- yeah, you need that. Same thing when, when uh, for, for example, like if, if for editing. Like if, yeah. I, if I shoot something, that's why I don't want to edit it. I want someone you else want to look at it. You want an editor to edit it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be stuck on things and not see things. Exactly. And, yeah. So uh, I said to him, listen, go make the version of the film you want to make. And let's see it. He goes working with the writers and everything, and uh, he comes back with this phenomenal new plot. Completely amazing new plot with new twists. He gave all of a sudden Lustig had depth. He had a relationship. It's, it became like it's stuff that I'm like, how did I not see this? You see, this is <laughs> one of the things that I fucking love about movies, though, about making them. I love collaborating. I love it. Absolutely. I think I, I'm it's, not one it's of those key. dictatorial, yeah, 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 tyrannical. Yeah. No, I, I think it's so exciting to see what people bring to the table. Yeah. And it just it just goes up and up and up. Like I think some, so. It's, I think you got to be... I think, look, there is an amazing thing that I keep saying that the Hollywood has an incredible thing, which is collaboration. It does not exist anywhere else in the world. I've worked on films outside the U.S. with European directors, with... Uh, Lebanese directors, whatever, and the collaboration is non-existent, and it's very difficult for the team. Well, in France, for example, like the whole auteur thing, the director is kind of go- is yeah, more yeah, god but, than but even here, and right? there's nothing wrong with that. Of and course, I'm assuming that's similar because yeah, the yeah, French yeah, Lebanese yes, connection, yes, of course, yeah. yeah. But the problem is that uh, the director, who a lot of times it's their movie, and you know, you gotta as a producer. You learn to be a dark horse. You're behind, you know, you're trailblazing everybody, but you're also pushing everybody. And, and that's what we love doing. But at the same time, it's, I think, crucial for the director to have a co- collaborative team around them to break that complete obsession with, like, this is going to work. Because sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. And look, you look, at, you look at European films, and I, and I think they're phenomenal. There's obviously a lot of phenomenal films. But there's a lot of films that people don't see in Europe that are unwatchable. Yeah. Just like there is crap here. I'm not sure. saying, you know, but you tend for some reason, I mean, you know, we see European films here be like, oh, like, do you Hollywood needs to be more like European cinema. <laughs> but you're seeing like three, four, five films out of the hundreds that get made that are unwatchable yeah. because of a high auteur thing. I personally, and this is, and this might offend people, but I'm not into it, mm-hmm. you know. I, I, I'm not into that just author thing where you, there's no story. I want to go into a film. I think there needs to be a story. There needs to be characters. There needs to be emotion. There needs to, it's a roller coaster. So, so can, you, can you tell me a little bit about like what your uh, role is in, in that as a producer? Like A lot of people, I mean, I have some idea, but I mean, a lot of people, the idea of a producer is really kind of vague it's and more confusing the money to guy? a lot of people. Yeah, they go, oh, that's the guy who pays for it. Yeah. That's okay. I don't have any money though. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know what I mean. But but you, and some producers are more creatively uh, involved than others. Yeah. I'm assuming you tend to be more on that side. Yeah, I. And, I mean, so can you tell yeah, a little yeah. bit about what you do. Like I mean, look, that, I, I, I always, work? I always, the analogy for me is, the director is an architect, and the producer is the project manager. Okay. The producer is the person who will put up the concert, who will sell the tickets who will come up with the great, cool location, but they can't go up on stage and perform. It's the director who's going to go up and perform, and the actors are going to go up and perform, and the writers are going to go up and perform. But you play a role in who but those people are, But you're the orchestrator are, into, yeah. Yeah. And I think that good producers are people who find talent, mm-hmm. who know how to scout these talents, they know how to find material that is different, and they develop it with these people, while not obstructing the director's vision. I mean, it's very important. Look, when you hire a director, you're hiring them for a reason. You know, she or he have a vision and a look on certain things. That's why you hire them. Right. If you don't agree with that, either don't hire them or just go do it yourself. Right. So you have, as a producer, an obligation and uh, um, and you have to take a stand next to the director's vision. But while reminding them that at the end of the day, you want people to see this. I mean, my biggest, my biggest push to a director is always like, look, you don't want only your family to see this. You need <laughs> the world to see this. Don't you want people to watch your film? And sometimes directors get into 
this very uh, vision uh, mentality, yeah, right. which is good. But I think uh, they need producers that bring them back into the gravity. And this is where the magic, I think, happens. Because now all of a sudden... Because, look, I always I love this thing in design. When you go to design schools, they teach you this thing that I love, which is called Maya. Maya is most advanced yet acceptable. So how, how can I do the most advanced product or film or idea, but yet remain acceptable to people? Right. And I think it's phenomenal if you think about it. It applies to anything. The iPhone became successful because it's perfect Maya. It's not telling people to learn something new. Right. It's something they know, but it's very advanced. Right. It's uh, an electric car, like, I don't know, is cool because it's still a car, but it's very advanced. Right. So if you go and throw a product at people and you're asking them to learn a new language or a new, learn a new habit to use it, they're not going to use it. Right. Same goes for films. If you go to see a film and it doesn't talk to your typical senses and to your sort of intellect you're not gonna uh, you're not gonna succeed right you have to give the audience something that they feel oh this is very common but yet it's very advanced in that's a way right. it's very high cool it's, it's high concept it's high, it's high it's cool and that's why like good sci-fi films work because all of a sudden you feel like oh we can live in a world like this you can never live in a world of any sci-fi film that I think I bet you've seen in the last five no, years I think sci-fi is a good example like there's there's, <laughs> there's like a couple of extremes. You can have uh, big robots battling each other in, yes. in a mall movie, yeah. or you, you can have a black and white uh, clown smoking, making pancakes in Poland. Exactly. Or something. So something in between those two <laughs> works. So yeah, I mean, no, but seriously, like someone like with science fiction, or someone like Stanley Kubrick is a really good example. Yes. He, you know, there's a lot to his movies, but yes. he, you know, you could say like, uh, but they're accessible. Very much, like yeah. you. I don't know. Somebody, Joe Blow could watch Full Metal Jacket and be like, absolutely. "This is a cool Vietnam movie." You know, yeah, you know, absolutely. You know what I mean? So, there's definitely a balance in between there, and, and it's a balance between accessibility and also economics. Economics, and of then course. Also yes. Also communicating. Yes. Something, yes. You know? So I think to go back to the collaborative discussion, um, I think it's crucial to have this collaborative effort, and um, and ideas. And look, I mean, I've seen. Uh, I, I think the best people in the business are all collaborators. I've never heard like, oh, this is a person that does, does everything themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe there is. I don't know them. Uh, but I feel like, yes, you have a great director, great producer, great writer. They're all collaborating. They, they don't necessarily have to agree. But the fact that they're challenging each other constantly at making things better or different is when the magic happens in, in, and this is when you start feeling oh holy shit this works so what do you think it is that, that makes you a good producer like uh, and I say this for example before you answer like I went to a, I went to a design school actually too mm -hmm. I went to Art Center yeah. College of Design oh yeah I love, the, I love the Pasadena yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it was I, cool. I regret not being a designer going there <laughs> yeah you should be a guest speaker or a teacher or I would love that <laughs> um, so this is a call out Art Center yeah uh, but um so one of the things that I realized in, in, in directing things is that, that isn't really taught is so much of it is about leadership. Absolutely. You have to be a leader, like an officer, yes. like a captain yes. of a ship and had no idea. And, and there's so many different balances of things. And you mentioned like being good, you know, visually or whatever, you know, a lot of, a lot of people tend that I noticed tend to be very talented that way, but mm -hmm. have a weird, almost resentment for actors or a fear of them and, uh, they're, 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 yeah, they're not they, comfortable. They don't know how to, yeah, it freaks yeah. them out. Emotions freak them out, or I don't know what it is, uh -huh. but, or it's the other way around. Or, so there's a lot of things to balance. But so back to you know, a leadership quality is crucial. Yes, and I think you can probably learn it, but a lot of it's you have it or you don't. I think so. Yeah. Um. So with pr with producing, yeah, um, leadership is obviously a, has yes. to be a huge yes. thing. Yes. But what 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 qualities? What is it that would that makes I you think, a producer? I think I think that I think that. Uh, first of all, you gotta be a crazy risk taker. Yeah. I think so. A calculated not a, one? Not necessarily. I oh, mean, yeah? smartly. Yeah. Smart but risk bold. taker, but bold. And if you fail, you fail. I mean, I don't know anybody that created anything from a first shot that was became that became very successful. Whether it comes to fashion. Architecture, design—I don't know anything. 
Didn't Hemingway say the first draft of anything is shit? I'm pretty sure it is. I think you yeah. said that. Yeah. <laughs> it is because it is. It's very – because you have so much ideas, so many ways of going about something, and you just got to start putting it down, and it just doesn't work the way you think it works in your head. So <clears throat> I think first foremost is to be very aggressively bold and a risk taker. And again, not risk taker by risking you know, problems. It's no. just more like – Let's just try to make this movie, let's say. I mean, yeah. since we're talking about films. Let's just try to make this film. Let's try. Like, I've, it's funny. I've done six movies, five of which have been with first-time directors. Oh, wow. And it became a stigma now that I produce first-time directors. And That's the, a pretty cool one. No, it's very cool, I think. Yeah. It wasn't very cool at the beginning because okay. it's hard to sell. Yeah. But I started realizing something, which is first-time directors are hungry... They're, they're anxious, they're feisty, they're aggressive. Get something and all approved. of these are incredible qualities yeah. in a director to make a film. Yeah, yeah. And what we, what we started doing was couple these directors with veteran uh, filmmakers so they'll godfather them. Just like we did with The Pyramid, for example. We had Greg Levasseur, who's a first-time director, his partner and friend, Alex Aja, who's a veteran director, he got fathered him into it. And that is good because it creates a certain like seal of approval for a lot of money people, distribution, studios, all of this. It's like, oh, someone sees something in this person, so let's be behind them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, what it does is, of course, it gives the, the person doing it the first time also feel like, okay, I can lean on somebody, yeah. you know. Which is great. Gives them a little Gives them belief a, in themselves. Yeah, too. of course. Uh, but also, to go back to it, it's like, you, as a producer, I now f- I get very excited about first-time directors. I really get very excited. I think like, that's cool. Yeah, I, I really think. And, and that's part of going back and taking risks. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, first-time directors are, are probably higher risk than somebody else. But I don't know if that's true. It's that's just, just because the fear of the business and the it's pe- a fear of the know, business. It's the first fear of like around. being first, mm-hmm. you know. But I don't know. I mean, I can name you now ten films probably from veteran directors that didn't work, and these people sure. were big names director. Because I don't think anybody sets out to make a bad film. I I, sure. I will not believe it, you know. And but things happen. Uh, sometimes teams don't come well together. There's no synergy. I don't know. Or right. Shootings gets delayed. Interference, from interference. There's things. so much. Yeah. There's so many elements in yeah. making a film that can go wrong. Absolutely, it's crazy. And they will go wrong. And they will go wrong. <laughs> yeah. And they tend to go wrong actually. So that's I think one big thing for a producer to be risk taker. Second, second quality I think which I learned, I learned the hard way, is delegation. Mm. You got to be able to delegate and trust people that you're delegating. But this I think comes with time. Because that's when you build your network of people that you trust. Mm -hmm. So let's say I hire you to be producing something with me. I'm trusting you're going to deliver this because I know you do this or you did this. Delegation is a big thing for producers because it's a big job. And uh, you need to be able to manage all these, you know, to to become a manager rather than just do do things yourself. That's the leadership again right there. And at the same time, I think you should never be afraid of empowering your teammates. A lot of people go about the business afraid of empowering their DP or their actors or their directors and I, and, or giving them credit. And I think that as a producer, you have to be very selfless about credit. Very I think this selfless is actually about a credit. leadership quality as well. Yeah, because look, at the I end of the day, this is your that. movie. Like, good leaders do that. Everybody's though. here because in, on the set, it's because of you in a way. But you don't have to go around saying this to everybody. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just, it's, it's weird. People get very hang up on this. And I think this is something my dad taught me when I was a kid. He always used to say to us, go do whatever you want. And don't be afraid of giving credit. Because if it's not yours, it won't be yours anyway. So give out credit. Because, it, because if it's yours, it will be yours. Yeah. And I think a lot of producers become territorial. And they become... Uh, obsessed with this thing. Well, there's a lot of ego in this business. And there's more a lot than of others. egos, probably. You know, and then, yeah. and then, what happens is they start clashing with the director, 
and uh, it creates a bad negative energy yeah. and everybody's unhappy and it's just I think it's it's a, it's a you're going down a rabbit hole yeah yeah and you there's know? no reason for it and there's no reason and for so it so often it is it's it yes. all goes down from the top like that yes too. or yes up. or up but it it, it rides and on you I in the think, direction. And I think that producers among each other, sometimes this happens between producers. I think it's very imperative to define who's doing what on a film as producers. Like, the reason why my business partner and I work so well together, because he comes from an editing background. He's an editor. I know for a fact that I finish a film, I will give it to him, he'll finish it. I don't have to deal with this. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm there, I get into a lot of issues, but... I know that he's going to go do this thing. He basically turn it over from but, there. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that we know this. We know that he's not going to come and tell me, oh, do this, this, this way. And I'm gonna, not going to tell him, like, you know, why are you doing the sound this way? Or like, you know, there's, it's like, it's again, but this is very mechanical delegation. But in a way or another, it does create a good, better partnership at working together. So, and you surround the director and the film with a better team. You have five, sometimes you watch these films and there's five producers on them or even now more. It's becoming like a crazy thing. Yeah, I see that a lot, actually. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's it's upsetting for us because all of a sudden your credit is diluted. Yeah. But at the same time, what role maybe... role you play? Yeah, but maybe it is needed. I don't know. I mean, every film has its own yeah. story. Uh, but at the same time, I think if everyone is doing something and you need these many people, then good. Then it doesn't matter. As long know? as it gets done? As long as it gets done yeah. and the movie is good and people are happy and, I mean... Who ca- and I'll say who cares like if you think about it the movie is the movie we're in the film industry you and I are in the film industry I guarantee you you won't know half the names on half the films that are on these credits yeah. yet this causes most of the problems yeah. on films yeah yeah it's true it's crazy it's true you know the best speech that I heard recently or who's from, first or who's whose name first? is over whose name oh my or? god it's like <laughs> I don't know I mean my parents are are more into the cinema because of me and I will guarantee you there are there are an audience that doesn't remember if my name or Scott's name my business partner were before or after and we're both right. partners and these are my parents who should pay attention maybe I'm just <laughs> <laughs> exactly. but you know what I mean like yeah, it has yeah, yeah. so much no value even yeah. to the people that are close to you so one of the best things that said that I heard two years ago when George Clooney was accepting his uh, Louis B. Mayer I think award at the Golden Globes he was giving a tribute to, um, what's his name? I don't even remember the name of the actors, but I can remember his movies. Uh, what, the what? Mrs. Doubtfire guy. Oh, Ram Williams. Ro- yeah, Ram yeah. Williams. And he said, how many of us in this room, and you know, you're, in the Golden, you're at the Golden Globe, so a lot of these people are in the film industry, right? Yeah. You would think. How many of us remember the awards that Williams won? Nobody. But how many was it of Google us? Hunting or what was it? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, he's yeah, won multiple. Yeah. But how many of us remember his movies? Right. Everybody. No, he's. That's a good point. You know what I mean? Like, so in a way that you want to make a great film yeah. to be out there and being talked about and remembered. And if that takes multiple people and seeding some of your ego, <laughs> I think it's okay. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm with. I'm completely with you, and I, I actually enjoy it. I love that kind of thing. It's cool. I mean. But you said something earlier too that, like, I'm just I was I'm curious about when you're talking about the, the quality of being bold and you know taking risks. And to me, and you know, you can stop me anytime if you disagree or correct me. But that seems like a, a very culturally American quality. Being bold. Yeah, or being bold or taking big risks, or, mm-hmm. or it's just like uh, going for it. Yeah. You know, fuck it. Whether yes. it, some people may consider that naive, and maybe it yes. is. Oh, fuck it. We can do it. Yeah. Let's try to go to the moon. Whatever. I don't yeah, know how, yeah, but yeah, let's yeah, just yeah. do it. Um, and and uh, I have a lot of, of European friends. My girlfriend, you know her, her friends. Mm-hmm. We have yeah, of course. Sweden. Yeah. So, yeah. And I hear a lot of stories about why they left. And it's because mm-hmm. of a lack of that kind of attitude and that kind of thinking. And, and oh, my God. And people tend to come here. That, so I don't know if where <laughs> Things in Europe take so much time because Europe, nobody... <laughs> you grew up in, Le- in Lebanon, right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that's similar or different or... But yeah, do you Do you have this this attitude? Do you feel like this is um, something that's more common and acceptable here than, than there? Or no? Yes. Yeah? I, that's, a, that's an incredible question because it's a very complex question, I think. It's a sociological, psychological question. 
And I think that it's a combination of both. It's a combination of, like you said earlier, which is you either have it or you don't have it. And, and I think that if you look at the personal lives of the people who take risks that are in the film industry, like I'll give you examples. I, I don't hesitate too much at doing something, at taking a trip, at buying a, a thing or at, I don't know, uh, going on a, on a to, I don't know, to an event or something. Yeah. I don't, it's, it, and I think it's part of the, this is part of the character. When you do this in your personal life, and in your work, then it's a character. But then the context, I think, comes into play. The U.S., I think, is definitely an incredible place to do this because when you are crazy enough to jump, you'll always find people who'll jump with you. In Europe, and let's say in the Middle East, uh, it's the two cultures that I know very well, mm -hmm. um, it's so hard to surround yourself with the people that are going to jump with you. For some reason, there's always like... I don't, like know a, a safety, I don't know if it's a cynicism? I don't know. I don't know if it's a safety net. I don't know if it's like people are... People are more like, no, let's wait and see. I don't know what it is. I, I cannot probably put my hand or on they it. They talk it to death. Or like I know like in France, for example. Here, here, I'm going to do a plus and minus on this real quick. I want to yeah, hear what you're yeah, yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, because... You know, I mentioned like, oh, you know, it is kind of naive. Let's say, oh, we're going to try to go to the moon in 10 years, mm -hmm. even though we're yeah. basically barely flying jets right now. Yeah. And, you know, you can get shit done and it's exciting, but you can also be, we can, in this culture, we can be a real bull in a China shop. Like, oh, uh, a b couple buildings this went down. Let's go do something somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe Iraq. They have nothing yeah, to do with yeah, it whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. And boom, there you go. Yeah. So it's but like that's this, part of that culture. It, that it yeah. is. That's yeah. the plus and minus. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's taking action, but sometimes yeah. it's not always the right one. No, I, <laughs> that's true. Um, you know? I think that, yeah, but I, I mean, look, I don't think you can have the leadership in so many industries like the U.S. does. And I mean, you know, again, I'm not getting into now the shit that's happening right now. Sure, yeah. I mean, wow. I'm talking about the U.S. We as, talked about that before we started recording. Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, yes, <laughs> I'm talking about. I'm talking about the U.S. as this beacon of advancement, of leadership in the world, of innovation. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can have an innovative country like this, a bold country like this. This is the country that has the best films, the best medicine, the best. Uh, engineering, the best innovation. This is a country that I mean, I can it's go all on true, and on but and it's on. Not for everybody, if no, no, you can no, no, afford no, no. it, absolutely. Or if absolutely. It, you know. But what I'm saying is that you know, some kid from South Africa can come here and become Elon Musk. Why That's didn't true. He, why didn't you know some kid from Syria can become here can come here and become Steve Jobs? Some you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. so, in a way that why didn't these people do these things respectively in their countries? Why isn't the Oscar the French version of the Oscar as important as the, as the U.S. Oscars. Yeah. Why isn't the English version of the Oscars as exciting and important for someone's career as winning an Oscar here? So because I think that the wealth this country has, the multiculture this country has, which is <laughs> hopefully that's... Interesting not, point I know, right I know, I know. This is what's... <laughs> yeah. This is the scary, what we were talking about before the recording, which is blocking blocking these people from coming I mean you know, I'm not getting into the politics now but yeah. you're basically blocking the core essence of the drivability of this country this country is you know I'm from Lebanon you're from Seattle Maria's from Sweden uh, my wife's from Canada like I mean you know my business partner's from Texas my other yeah. business partner's from from London his wife's from Wales I mean in, 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 in just, in just also, two by the minutes way, I, I just named you five six countries probably like right. it's crazy and they're but, all here <laughs> and I'm from Seattle but obviously my yeah 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 going back a few of generations course. yeah, not, yeah you know, you're so not from Seattle not from here, yeah. yes. <laughs> no but what I'm saying is but yeah it's I think I th you know it's it's like it's like a crazy relationship right you're gonna have a crazy probably good sex and crazy bad shit storming out of a dinner on in a <laughs> restaurant yeah. scene. You know, but every, everything is so hot and cold. I right. think this is how the U.S. is. I don't think the U.S. is a mild country. Right. It's either hot or cold. It's all. It's either you're creating, you're catapulting a guy to Mars, 
and you're at the same time invading Iraq for no reason. Right, right. <laughs> I don't know if you could. I don't know if humans are capable of like catapulting a guy to Mars and then being very cool with each other. I don't know. Maybe I. I don't know. It's. Uh, I don't know. That's so interesting. <laughs> You know, I just heard the other day. I'm not getting off the subject. It just reminded me. Do you know Henry Rollins, the guy who was a singer from Black Flag? He's uh, yes, I've, actor. yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I just heard him on some interview, and he said he travels the world constantly. And I don't mean like staying in hotels. I mean he really travels. Yeah, like, yeah. And like he says hardcore that, traveling. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in hardcore places. Yeah. And he and he's been to crazy places. And he said that he thinks this is the craziest country he's ever been to. Oh, it is crazy. I mean, it is <laughs> and look, the most dangerous. Actually, it is. It is crazy. It is. There is some. There's, I don't know why, but um, there's an anxiety when you live in the U.S. Yeah. There's a certain anxiety that well, surrounds you. I don't know what it is. It's every man for himself. I mean, it's, Probably, it's that's still what it a little is. bit of Wild West left over, I think. I know? think so. I you think know? so. It's weird that, you know, my friends there, like, when I go back to the Middle East, and they're like, oh, that's a crazy place. I'm like, no. It's actually very easy and cool and partying and, you know... It's it's for some reason it's very relaxing. Yeah, for some reason, I don't have to check my I don't know my money all the time or my taxes all the time or my or right. the legal stuff all the time. I if I if I hear a police car in the street, I don't get for some reason you'll be driving down the street here and there's a policeman and you haven't I, done I anything nervous. wrong and you're nervous. Yeah, I, get I don't nervous. know why. Yeah, me too. Well, it's just it's a weird. There's a, that's why I'm saying there's an anxiety living here. But I think that and, anxiety also breeds. And you come from Lebanon, and you're saying, and I'm coming that. from Lebanon. I'm saying, that's, I mean, that's yeah, saying something. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but that I think anxiety also breeds this creativity and pushes people to make a reason why they're here. Probably, I don't know. I think it's very complex. It's interesting, and maybe there's. I may be going off the edge a little bit, but everybody that's here, for almost everybody, mm-hmm. for the most part, you know. They made a bold move of some kind, or their ancestors did. There's something yeah. in there that that needs more. That's that is an inherent risk taker too. Yes, and especially if you're on the West Coast, even because those are people yeah, that that's kept even, going. Yeah, correct. And uh, so there is something, and it's in you just as much as I mean, maybe you more than me. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe it's in whether it's in your in your family and the way you're raised, or it maybe literally in your blood, or just in you because you came here yourself first Probably, person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's something there's something out there you know that doesn't settle for no for it's, the way things and, and are and i don't you know? know what it is i and, think and that it lives in our the zeitgeist in the, of yeah the culture, yeah you know? i think so i think i think you know it's it's like I'll, I'll tell you a funny thing i went to japan in the summer as a with my family mm-hmm. and uh when you when we're sitting at the table or anything japanese people will ask like where are you coming from and or you know and, you know, everyone will say where they're coming actually from. Like, my parents will say, like, we just came from Lebanon. Or my sister will say, I'm coming from France because that's, that's where she lives. <clears throat> and, they, you know, their reaction is mild. And I say, I'm coming from Los Angeles. And they'll go crazy. <laughs> they're, like, jumping. They're, like, as if they met the Messiah. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. And I'm, like, Japan is a more elevated country than the U.S., yeah. In a sense of respect, um, cleanness. Yeah. Um, there is so much respect for nature, for each other, right. for 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 the food. For I mean, it's weird. It's an yeah. incredible place. It's Yet, very compliant and obedient. Yes. Culture too, though, right? And I always, and I kept saying when we were in Japan, if we ever meet an alien species, the Japanese should be the first people talking to them because we will look good as humanity. <laughs> Because everything is clean, everything is yeah. so well managed, very well, right. I don't know, looks very good, um, respected extremely well. I'm sure the Japanese culture has its own problems, and the society sure. has, of course. But what I'm saying is, it's you look at it and it's like an elevated form of humanity. Mm-hmm. But yet, you tell them you're from LA, they go crazy and they all love the American culture and they want to be here and I'm like no 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 you don't get it there's trash in places in LA on the street yeah oh yeah <laughs> they don't oh, yeah. care parts of LA look like a third world country <laughs> yeah, I, mean, exactly. I mean quite literally exactly so so, but but it's just it's. I think again it's that it's that I'm gonna I'm gonna use a word which is not a nice word probably to describe this but it's it's this 
propaganda that the U.S. has created as an image to the world, which is we are the leaders, we are the best people, we create the most, we advance the most. Yet you look at the facts. The internet in the U.S. is the 17th in terms of speed yeah. regarding a, oh, the we education. Have no I mean, yeah, yeah, the we education, have none. the education. Well, I don't know now where it is. It's really bottom now. <laughs> yeah. A week ago, yeah. 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 <laughs> Jesus but Christ. you know what I mean? Like, but yet still, everybody wants to come here and everybody, and I want to be here and I love being here and I love living here. Um, but I don't know what it is. I think, it, I think it's such a deeper sociological, yeah. psychological issue, a good issue to discuss. And why is this country so attractive? What, what's going on with this place? Because it's not easy to be here. Yeah, no. It's no. not a given no, it's to not. be here. No, it's, it's not. not. You know, it's like you said before, everyone's on their own in a way. Yeah. I mean, you know, but yet, look, we're here and I'm having fun. <laughs> so. How did you, so I want to, I want to, um, so where are we right now? We're about 45 minutes or so. Let's like yeah, keep it good. around an okay, hour. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to find out a little bit more about like, so where you came from and how, you got drawn to what you're doing right now. Like, yeah. was there some sort of turning point or what did you, were you at some point, were you going in a different direction? Mm, yeah. I mean, not really. I mean, it's funny how I honestly think that, and this is probably because I've had that personal experience. Every person is destined to do what they're going to end up doing. I think yeah. in a way or another. <clears throat> and you know, I was born in Lebanon. Um, and I grew during up the, during the war. The war. Yeah. yeah which was pretty tough. Um, and funny, I say this because when I came to the U.S. and we were talking about anxieties, and uh, for a while, some of the anxieties I would have is like waking up in the middle of the night and I'm in the middle of like a war zone. Or the funny other part is that I have a math exam the second day. I was so bad in math. At I math. too. I hate math. Yeah, I hate math. <laughs> so I would wake up and I'm like, oh, holy shit, I didn't study for my math exam. And it was like, I'm not, and I'm in LA now and I'm being a film producer, but yet I had that, you know. Interesting. It's, it's funny. And, but, but I had a recurring dream for a while when I came here about the war. But, and, and this is why I'm very against it because I grew up in it. Um, so I think early on, the first film I saw was Roger Rabbit. The first film. The first the very film. First film the first, in movie. In at, the theater. At, at, in the theater. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was Roger Rabbit. And um, and I was fascinated. I remember the, the movie theater very well. Yeah. And I was so fascinated, so crazed by it. And uh, for, I don't know, I mean, maybe because I'm a dreamer and this is something, and, it, and I felt this is a dream world or something like that. Um, and then the second film I saw was Batman. With Jack Nicholson, yeah. you know, that Batman. Funny enough, my mentor later on became Mark Kenton, who, um, you know, who produced these films. Well, that's full circle. Yeah, it's crazy. One of my mentors. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I, I was drawn to, this, to the movies since I was a kid by, by fascination. Uh, and I would go to the movies on my own. Yeah, I mean, again, I my, yeah, mind you, in Lebanon, it wasn't, like, there wasn't a lot of activities to probably do. You know, and you're young and whatever. But um, and then I considered a lot of careers in design. In I'm obsessed with antique stuff, so I even considered becoming like an antique That's restorator. Yeah, because I love that stuff. I love old stuff. You still are you into that right now? I I bit? try to collect yeah. a lot of things. I try to get some old cars. Yeah, that's you know cool. things like this. Um, and um, so I I considered that, and then we got to a point where. Uh, funny enough, I had a friend who's still my friend now, or you know, childhood friend. He's always knew that he wanted to be a director. And the way we used to, you know, go around school and everything, he used to tell me, You need to be a producer. And I, you know, as a kid, what the fuck is a producer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're trying to define a producer right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, still. Yeah, still. I'm trying to define what I'm doing. So, uh, but. <laughs> And, uh, and he would try to explain to me because his dad used to be like a director, cinematographer for TV shows in Lebanon, right. on like, you know, on the national channel. And he always knew he wanted to do that. So, um, and it turns out that he thought like that because I had no problem talking to anybody 
or going up to someone okay. and opening up a discussion. So he knew what it was. He obviously. knew, yeah, probably, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was something that, you know, we used to joke about it. And, um, and then when I went, when I decided what I wanted to do, I sort of decided to be in the advertising marketing world because I love people and I love talking to people and meeting people. But yet I like the creative side of things. Yeah. So we thought like an ad- a combination of adver- advertising and marketing would be a cool combination. You know, you're in both worlds. And you have to think that you're in Lebanon and this area, you know, Hollywood and the idea of going to, the, you know, is, you know, it's, it's very far. Yeah. It's crazy far idea. But then, um, but then a friend of mine started producing a show called Top Gear, which is a car show oh, yeah. for the Middle East and licensing and all of this for Europe, sort of. Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East area. And I was sitting with him, and he had these like huge magazines on, on design and cars and all of this. And I was so into it just because I love design. I yeah. love, you know, these I history. Love design yeah, magazines it's, and yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm like, so what are you doing? And he's like, look, they just assigned me this project, and I have to like be creative about it because we're licensing the Top Gear thing, but we also have to create our own local segments in the show. And and I said you know and I said I can help you like what do you you know and he's like do you want to come and work on the show as you and you'll help me as an assistant I said sure so I started working on the Top Gear show as an assistant to the producer what a great opportunity yeah and I loved it yeah it was crazy cool and I decided I want to be in the media film world so I you know I then my dad saw an ad for um for a master's in producing at a French school um, and he's like just go ask him and you can enroll which was like between France and Lebanon and so I did that Where, what did you do for undergrad? so I did advertising and marketing oh marketing I okay. finished that uh, Bachelor of Arts and then I enrolled myself in, a, in another Bachelor of Arts in radio TV and film because I had no idea how you operate a camera or how do you do all these things and yeah. I thought a technical education might help me so yeah. I did that. I enrolled myself in that master's program. And then at the same time, I was like, you know what? I want to go to the U.S. and study in the U.S. I was initially wanted to do a master's in marketing. But then when I got into this, I was like, maybe I could do a master's in producing. And I looked at USC, they Chapman. Hand hand really yeah. Well, yeah. USC, Chapman, AFI. Right. USC, USC did, has a great program yeah. for producing, right? USC, the Peter Stark program, they didn't take me. Right. UCLA... Uh, so UCLA, I applied to UCLA. No, actually USC, UCLA didn't take me. They didn't accept me. USC, it was pending because they, they you know, they take a certain amount. Of, yeah. yeah, same thing. And then, crazy enough, because obviously Lebanon has a shitty infra- infrastructure. So if you get sent mail from overseas, you're probably not gonna get it. So I get an acceptance letter from an AFI. And I didn't get it. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I didn't get it. But listen to this. So I emailed them saying, listen, I applied. I paid $1,000. I get it. I got an interview. I thought it went well. If you guys didn't accept me, because the deadline was like May 10. And I didn't, didn't get it. I'm like, if you guys didn't accept me, just it would be cool. Just send me an email just yeah. so I know. Because I want to go to another school yeah. then. You know? Because AFI was my top choice. Yeah. And Chapman accepted me. So And they were like waiting. And I said, look, I'm, I'm just give me a week or so. So... Like two or three hours later, it was like probably 8 a.m. here. I get a call from the registrar at AFI. They're like, we sent you a document. You're accepted. Oh, man. And I was like, what? And it was like, it was a crazy thing. I mean, I started jumping and crying and it was like That's crazy. So cool. I was That's so, so cool. yeah. And then they FedExed me another acceptance copy. Oh, they did. And then the war in Lebanon in 2006 started again. Right. I remember that very yeah. well. <laughs> It was a Hezbollah Israel. Yep. It was in the summer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And good luck getting out of the country. Yeah. And so what I I ended up doing, I took a small bag. That's how I left Lebanon. I took a small bag, only like maybe like three underwear, two two shorts, one jeans, like very basic stuff. I remember I told my parents, I left my parents at a corner of like, you know, like an exit to our house. And a taxi took me from our house through Syria to Jordan. 
because they used to do ceasefires. Holy they shit. weren't they weren't bombing the Christian areas, so you could exit. Yeah, and um, I went through Syria, and I remember. No, I, we went through the Bekaa Valley, which is a part of Lebanon, which is before you get into Syria. And uh, the driver was driving probably like 155, 170 miles Jesus an hour. Christ. And I told him, look, you got to freaking slow down because if you're not going to be dying from a bomb, we're going to die in the car crash. Yeah. Like, you gotta, so he's like, I cannot slow down. We were in this big ass Mercedes and he was, whole, he was like completely full speed. It was very stressful. Got into Syria. From Syria, I went to Jordan. Jordan took a flight to Bahrain. Spent a day in Bahrain. Took a flight to Dubai because it was so crazy to get flights to Europe and you know yeah. the US. Spent five days in Dubai, took a flight to Holland, spent a day in Holland, and went to Detroit. <laughs> My brother used to live in Indiana because he was doing his American Board of Medicine. I I went to Indiana. I spent a week with him, and then I flew to LA. That's how I came here. Wow! It was crazy, and there wow. was a, it was before the iPhone, before the messengers, and yeah. all of this. There was a blog on the uh, AFI chat room, and everybody was like, "Did you make it out? Are you gonna come?" Like it was a crazy thing. The support was phenomenal, and I came That's here. Mind blowing, man. Yeah, and I came here. My jaw was on the table just now, and for for like five minutes while I told you, it was a crazy. It was a crazy. I wish I had like a camera or anything to tape all of it. But it was. Yeah. We were leaving. That's like, quite a story in itself. Like, but you have to realize that there's bombing, 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 and there's like two hour ceasefires, and that's when you're exiting. And you know, and then for a few days, my parents don't know anything. No one knows anything. If I'm, I mean, it's just crazy. So then, when you when we go back to the conversation we were having talking to me about war and shit give yeah. me a fucking break yeah okay because no one's gonna get anything out of this you know so wow yeah so yeah and then i came here and and had you done that and had the you know i'm sorry i've been interrupt, but i mean this whole story long story short you probably wouldn't be able to get in now yeah no 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 but the, the thing is had so you done that now instead of then with the guy who's in charge. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. I mean, I don't know if I would have gotten a visa or anything. I mean, yeah. it's just stupid. But anyway, it's, that's yeah. a whole different No, but, but the thing is, here's the interesting part is that my visa, if I didn't do that, if I would have waited for, because we didn't know when this was going to stop. Yeah. You, know, you never know when it was. Syria's war has been, I don't know, five, six years now. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And my visa would have expired and I couldn't have gotten this career and I could have, I mean, it was just a crazy thing. <sighs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, you know, that's part of, I think, the, the big adventure of doing things and keep pushing and, yeah. This is what... This is why what happens right now and all the things that's happening, it's just pretty upsetting. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit like, it's upsetting. It's like people are so disconnected to the reality of what goes on. It's ridiculous. I really hope that uh, this episode uh, more people listen to than any others. You know, I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope yeah, that I mean, <laughs> for more, <laughs> more reason to one. But that was no. That's really something, man. That's really something. I mean, it's, I don't even know what to say about that. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, it was a time. It was it was difficult, and you and you come here because you know you want to leave. You know, in a cool way. You're coming. You're coming to study. You're coming to become in the film industry. There's you need to leave in an exciting high note. And now you're leaving in a way where your parents want you to leave. Yeah. Because they want you to have a life. Yeah. Wow. You're leaving in a way where, like, this is my, it's the new world for me. It's a, it, it's, it's a weird, complex situation you're in. Because you're in a way, and also, you know, I'm leaving and my parents are still in a war zone. Yeah. How, how, is my, how is your brain going to function properly? I mean, it's just so... It was difficult. At the beginning, it was very difficult. I'm, just, I'm sure it still is. Yeah, I mean... But do you ever... Do you t- take a look at yourself sometimes and be like, holy shit. Can you have some perspective and kind of look back from where you came from and how this yeah, happened? Yeah, my like, perspective is people need to wake the fuck up and stop <laughs> being, you know, you know... And people need to love each other. Yeah. And have more fun. There's so much fun to be had in this, on this earth. So much fun. I'm serious. <laughs> That's so cool. It is. So cool There's so saying. much fun. I mean, it's like, you know, when I, I always tell my teammates when we're making a film, because, you know, people get stressed and pissed and everything. And maybe because I've been into things that are much more life-threatening than making a film, yeah. you know. Yeah. I always say, guys, we're just having fun, honestly. It's just a movie. And and there's so much things to have fun with and on in life. 
Well, when, when you go through something that's mm-hmm. that's hard like this, traumatic or violent or all, all the above, it tends to, and you tell me if you agree or yeah. not, but I mean, it's very humbling, number one. I think it, I think it inherently makes you more compassionate for people. Absolutely. And it, yeah. and it makes you realize what your priorities are. Absolutely. You know? I think it gives and you an incredible gravity. Uh, it pulls you in a hard gravity into like... You know, <laughs> there are way more worse things than yeah. the stuff you deal with on a day-to-day basis. And, and uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I have my moments and I get upset and I get pissed. Yeah, and, of course. You know, of course. But, yeah, I mean, you know, I, uh, I think that... And I'm not saying people have to go through things like this to have perspective. Right. I think you can have perspective by having sure. education. Sure. By being out there, by meeting new people, by opening up to people and realizing, like... You know, everyone, look, everyone's trying to do something in yeah. a sense. I don't believe humans are, I, I have a hard time believing that humans dis- want to destruct things. Yeah. You know, I think humans want to build things. Everyone wants to build something, whether it's a family, whether it's a business, whether it's a hobby, whatever it is. These other things often come out of frustration of not being able to do that. Probably, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or being... And, and I, you know, I... I, I I've been recently fascinated by reading comments on article on political articles. So I read like a political article or an issue article in the news and I spend another good amount of time reading the comments that people put and these are oh people boy. I don't know. I don't know that might be a mistake. It is a mistake maybe but it's also fascinating to see the perspective that people have vis-a-vis each other. It's it, it, yeah. it's, it's another war that goes on in comments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's, it's <laughs> ugly, and I think it. I think it's it's amazing. I I really think that education is the solution for all of this. That makes traveling. Sad, I agree, but, but I mean, considering it, yeah, what happened, traveling is the solution for traveling, all of yeah, this. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm amazed by how many people in this country have not traveled. It's don't true. have passports. Yeah. It's like. Go see the world. I think that in, this in, country of all the uh, developed countries has the least amount of passports. Which is crazy. By far. But because the wealth in this country is not low. I mean, this is a wealthy country, and I think most people can afford traveling. And, uh, and I don't know. I understand the U.S. is very big, and I understand there's a lot of things to see here. And I still love traveling to places. I've, I haven't been to Seattle, and I would love to go to Seattle. That's yeah, great. Yeah, but okay, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. these are places. But I think that uh, traveling beyond your own culture is phenomenal. That's and it's huge, very enriching. Man. It's huge. It's crazy. Yeah. It's just you know? me, you know, and it's not to make an excuse, but you can see how it's set up in a way where it's easy for people here not to. I mean, we're a huge country with a couple of huge oceans on both sides. Yes. Of it. And, uh, you know, we make a lot of our own media and culture. And yes, we, yes. We, we're not we, we're not bordered by like ten countries that speak different languages. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of media and culture, you know, tends to be English, for example. So I'm saying like most Americans don't speak other languages because it's really easy not to. Yeah, I I, really, you know, I know. And so it's kind of a trap. It becomes sort of a trap, an isolated trap, it's like a vicious circle. Yeah, that's why <laughs> we still have our own weird math system. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. We don't really, you know, we have our own football, which I'm which a fan. Which is cool. Of, I mean, I, yeah, which no, I'm no. a huge fan. I, but, I mean, that's good. But I'm saying, but we're kind of isolated, you know. We're but I don't want to. I don't want to be like the person who's like, you know, the nag, nag, nag. Things don't work. I don't get that you're saying that at no, all. No, I love. Don't, you know, again, like I. I and I don't. I'm not the person who shits on my country for it. Yeah, I criticize it because I love it, but exactly. I'm not one of those people who feels you like. Just want it to be. I'm going to show how sophisticated I am. We're we're so awful. Yeah, we're, no, exactly. come on. We were, exactly. we do a lot of. We, there's a lot of great things about it, but there's a lot of shit things like everywhere. I agree. Like everywhere. I agree. You know? I mean, look, the the. I think that I go back to education because, and I obviously I didn't go to school here or anything, but. I don't know what are people studying because when I hear that the U.S. has saved the world twice from a world war from some Americans, it pisses me. It pisses me off because I have one answer. Yeah, you drop two nuclear weapons on Japan, and let me tell you, if I drop three, four nuclear weapons on the rest of the world, I'll save it from a lot of trouble as well. I mean, it's just like. You know, what do you mean by, like, you saved the world? How many wars have you started? How many problems have you started? Like, yeah. this, you know, we're in, a, we're in a time right now 
just because maybe I'm into it, but the environment is shifting and you can have a lot of solar energy, you can have a lot of wind energy, you can have a lot of, you can have electric cars, you can have, it's becoming accessible, it's becoming, it, it's a normal thing to have renewable energy. Yet, we're like, no, let's just go dig more oil and let's go pollute more. And it's like, oh, China's doing it. Yeah, but let's work with China to stop doing it rather than being, oh, they're doing it, let's do it. Yeah. Like, these are the things that I still don't comprehend yeah. in the culture and they sort of upset me in the sense that when you are an elevated, elevated country that you've created so much, I think you have the responsibility to better, keep bettering things yeah. and not recess into you know, whatever is comforting. Yeah, McDonald's is a very comforting food, but <laughs> let's try to eat McDonald's every day. You know what I mean? Like right. it's just, and you don't, do that yet, you don't do that because you know it's not healthy. Right. So why do you want to leave, a, let's say, a planet that is complete trash for for your kids or for, you know? Yeah. I mean, things like this that are fascinating to me where... That's why, going back to education, when you educate kids by saying, we're the greatest people on Earth, and you basically don't have to do anything because we saved the world from wars, right. and you know, then they're going to grow up thinking like, yeah, you know what, the world owes us. No, it doesn't owe you. You should actually educate them in a the sense like we're so great that we have more responsibility to keep doing this. And, you know, I think that uh, I, I hope that, you know, we'll have a generation that comes and says that because I came to this country to create a career. But now I'm hooked on to also making things better. Yeah. And I find that I can make things better here. I can, you know, probably change a few things in the environment, probably Educate. I mean, it's just you know yeah. the movies I try to make are also in that, um, but you know we'll see. <laughs> hey, can you? I'm so glad you said that, and I'm so glad that you did this too. Um, and maybe we can do another one someday if you feel. I would like. love maybe that. Maybe after yeah. you know we could do that a yeah. little down the road. Yes. Is there anything? Um, yeah, we're gonna wrap it up. So is there anything that uh, about these other projects that you have coming up, or or is there anything that I didn't ask you about, or maybe something you want to talk about for a minute? No, we should hang out more often. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> we should hang out more often. We'll do it over over stuff. drinks next time. Yeah, and see how I know. It goes. It'll be Instead good. Of coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how far we get. Yeah, I'll over drinks, it might become yeah a little bit less politically correct. <laughs> That's okay. But, That's okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're rated R here. Yeah, <laughs> you can throw in an F word if you want. No, now, just but for it's the hell it's just it's just upsetting, <laughs> and and uh, I, it's upsetting to to see that. And again, I know a lot of people are not pro Obama. I loved Obama. I and I go back to the politics because I feel like it's fine. everything is now dictated into this. Yeah, and it fast is again. It just fascinates me how you could be with like a world that has somebody who's trying to appease. And create tolerance, you know, in the world. And all of a sudden, you're like, all of a sudden, it's, it's in the black. And yeah. we're like, no, let's just create wars and hate. And I remember something which was very interesting. Um, there used to be a lot of hate towards the U.S. before Obama came. And then when I used to travel when Obama was been president, you feel like people fell in love with the U.S. again. Yeah. In Europe, in Japan, in the Middle East, people loved the U.S. as a country. Again, it became back this example of like, it's actually a very fucking cool place. And I would go and people will, you know, obviously when you come from the U.S. into another country, people want to always open subjects with you like, well, you guys do this. And, and, you, and I, I tend to defend it and I go crazy about like, what do you, guys, you know, now I don't know if I can defend it. We look idiots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We look a little bit idiots. It, it's not good. <laughs> it's not, it's good. not good. So, but as a longer yeah, discussion. it's not good. No, yeah. and it's one we're talking about. Maybe we can next time. Yeah, but yeah, that's a whole can of worms right now. Yeah, it's I mean, uh, again, again, like you know, this respect thing for women. It's like how hard could it you for you to respect your own mom or sister? Just apply it to every woman you see. I mean, it's just you know, it's like it's we live in this society where. We're educating people to respect somebody who brought you to life. Like, just have a one thought that there's no human being that came from a man. Sure. Okay? 
and respect that you were born through a woman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and to maybe be you just respect that all your life. I don't want to go too because we could talk for yeah, hours know, about this. But I'll just I, I'll say just this because I get into that I don't crazy. Think, <laughs> I, I now I kind of want to, but we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up in a second here. But I'll just say like, and I, I'm not here to. I don't. I don't talk about my political views on this yeah, very yeah, much, yeah. and because I I don't really give a shit about right or left or liberal and conservative yes. or parties. I don't give a shit about yeah, parties. I'm, I'm just done. Very much like you, yeah. Um, I just think that's a trap, and it, it just it's it's like a religion. It's like yeah, a religious dogma. Correct. Yeah. Um, but I'll say this: uh, I don't. I, I have a hard time seeing this current president can, making it through his entire four years. I don't. I, well, I, I have a hard time seeing that, and I'm not. I don't. I'm not telling you how or why, but I don't know how he's. I, I don't see how he's going to last. I don't, and uh, I think the bar, and anybody that's listening, if you voted for, him, I really, yeah, I don't yeah, care. Yeah. I don't yeah. care. I'm just saying, I'm not condemning anybody for anything, but I, I just think that uh, I don't think it's going to last. I think the the bar has been dropped low, and I think that the young people in the coming, if we make it through this next four years oh or so. God. Which I worry about, actually. That's another subject. Yeah. But uh, I think that the young people coming up feel the same way we do. In in fact, in the fact that, or in the idea that, um, I think the political party system, the two party system here, is going to f- fail. I think after this, it's just people are not going to buy it anymore. The, I, I think, think so. the young people are not are not buying it. I think so. So I think if we can make it through this current presidency. In the f- near future, I think there's going to be some kind of a, I don't know if I want to call it a revolution, but it's, there's something's going to happen different. Yeah. And, uh, and it's going to swing in, in the direction I think is going to be very positive, And I like to believe that. I hope so. I really hope so. I mean, I, I just want to say one last thing, which sure. fascinates me. You have a women march that yeah. happened. Huge. Huge. Not one arrest, by the way. Huge. And you have a president that doesn't go up and comment or says anything. That for me, yeah, is the death of America. It's the death of America. Yeah, could have just go up and say, "Look, I see you guys. You know, then let's just try to work together." Yeah. Just say that. You don't, I mean, don't don't get into it. Just say, "I see this." It's, there's I, obviously I've a heard lot of, you. There's a lot of yeah. I've heard you. There's a lot of frustration. I'm gonna work with you guys, and I don't want people to be frustrated. That's it. That's it. He would have. You know, the the best part is. Um, the best part in The Gladiator which is a film I love yeah he tells him you gotta win the crowd it's not about the show it's not about you killing and being a gladiator because anybody could probably do it and you're good at it but you gotta win the crowd that's how you win you win by winning the crowd not by winning the game because if you win the game and people don't like you no one cares right and I think it's a really interesting political statement you need to win the crowd yeah because uh, when you win the crowd, people will go with your vision. It's That's like the right. film industry. You have a great idea for a film. You surround yourself with the right people. You make the film because yeah. you've won a team around you. You've they won, believe in your they vision in the, because they, you do. And then you can make mm-hmm. an audience believe in it and then go watch it. Yeah. So it's the same thing. You've got to win the crowd. And by having such a woman march, you don't go say anything. How are you going to win the crowd? How are you going to win the crowd? It's impossible. So, anyways, how, how <laughs> this has been so fucking good. <laughs> Thank um, you. We've been so. How can yeah, people f- like follow you? Do you want you have like a Twitter handle or anything? And yeah, I have a Twitter. Like I have a Twitter. So I have they can a, follow you and see how your movies are going. Yeah, I have a Twitter, but uh, I'm trying to. St- yeah, you keep it private. To keep it, no, no, no. It's open, but I try to keep it focused on movies. <laughs> okay, so not, <laughs> don't uh, don't tweet. Yeah, uh, I'm not tweeting Trumpy yeah. stuff towards. Yeah. Uh, I want to come back. I want to be able to come back into the country. <laughs> 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 keep it to the movies. Yeah, keep it to the movies. <laughs> and let's just make movies that are with a strong message. So, thanks so much, man. No, thank and you for uh, having me. This is incredible. It's been great, I and I hope we fun. can do it again. Honestly, yes, I would love that. Yes. Um, all right, thanks, man. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. You too. So that was Shadi Matar, you guys. Such a cool guy. I was so happy to have him on. I, I really love that talk, and I hope to have him on again. And as far as that goes, uh, if you have any uh, any questions, any comments, suggestions for other guests, anything at all, you can always email me at triumphanddisasterblog at gmail.com. I answer every one of them, and I love to hear from you guys. And uh, don't forget to follow the uh, Triumph and Disaster blog uh, Instagram and Twitter. That's going to be on, on the shoddy um, 
episode blog post. If you go to triumphanddisasterblog.com, you'll see it all there. And it's all over the page. And as usual, if you like uh, what I'm doing here, it just really helps with uh, the promotion of the show. If you go to iTunes and just leave a rating and review, and I will be happy to call you out in the next episode, unless you want to keep it anonymous. I'd love to just thank you publicly and call your name out. And um, thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next week. Triumph and Disaster.